good evening to everyone, honorable dignitaries, distinguished guests, and my dear colleagues, friends, and my dear students. On this occasion of 7th Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Lecture, I, Dr. Priya Viresh Prabhu, faculty of Chamber, Chambur Karnataka College of Law, your host for this evening, take immense pleasure in extending a warm welcome to you all on behalf of the Department of Law, University of Mumbai, in collaboration with Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Trust. This evening is indeed momentous, as it has brought together all the legal stalwarts and luminaries to honor and commemorate late Chief Justice Mr. M.C. Chagla, who was a great jurist, visionary, and a legal legend, whose thoughts and wisdom serve as a beacon of light even to this day. No number of adjectives can describe his lordship and his valuable contribution to the legal fraternity which he has left behind as his legacy. On this celebrated occasion, we are very much honored and privileged to have Honorable Mr. Justice Nariman Roynton, former judge of the Supreme Court of India, as the chief guest. We are also proud to have Honorable Mr. Justice Riyaz Chagla, judge of the Bombay High Court, Mr. Pradeep Kamtekar, finance and accounts officer, University of Mumbai, Honorable Mr. Justice B.N. Sri Krishna, former judge of the Supreme Court of India, and Honorable Mrs. Sujata Manohar, former judge of the Supreme Court of India with us. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let us commence this program with the auspicious lighting of the lamp. I most humbly request all the honorable dignitaries to please kindly come forward to light the lamp.
Mr. Shomit Salunke and Mr. Mayur Jadav, I now most respectfully invite our honorable dignitaries to please come up on the dais. I now request Dr. Rajashri Enverari to felicitate Honorable Mr. Justice Riyash Chagla, Judge of the Bombay High Court. Please, ma'am. I request Dr. Swati D. Rotella to felicitate Mr. Pradeep Kamtekar, Finance and Accounts Officer, University of Mumbai. Please, ma'am. I request Dr. Sanjay Jadav to felicitate Honorable Mr. Justice B. N. Sri Krishna, former judge of the Supreme Court of India. I request Professor Jyoti Minocha to felicitate Honorable Mrs. Justice Sujata Manohar, former judge of the Supreme Court of India. May I now request Mr. Sandeep Savalkar to felicitate Justice Variava. Now may I please call upon Dr. Swati Rotela, Head, Department of Law, to welcome the gathering. Good evening, everyone. 
on the auspicious occasion of Basant Panjmi, which was celebrated yesterday, and also the 74th Republic Day of India, I welcome all the dignitaries today who are present with us for this seventh Chagla Memorial Lecture Series. We have number of guests today, the dignitaries on the dais, that is Honorable Mr. Justice Rohinton Nariman, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, Mr. Justice Riyaz Chagla, Judge, Bombay High Court, Justice Sri Krishna, and all the senior counsels of the bar and the bench. We also have Justice Sujata Manohar and many other dignitaries who are present with us, the practicing lawyers of the various courts in India, the students who have come to come with us to attend the function, all my colleagues in the Department of Law, that is Dr. Rajashree Varadi, Dr. Rashmi Oza, senior professor in the department, and presently she is professor of Chagla Memorial Lecture. We also have our colleagues, that is Professor Sanjay Jadav, Professor Dipali Patil, Professor Alka Patil, all the teachers from the Karnataka Chamber College who are there with us to celebrate this occasion, to understand the two democracies, which are the largest in the world, that is the US democracy and the Indian democracy. Sir is a good reader, a good historian, and also one of the finest judges who has written n number of judgments which are recorded in the history of Supreme Court. So we are welcoming you, sir, on behalf of the Department of Law, University of Mumbai. We have today our finance officer, Mr. Kamtekar, and all the other dignitaries, that is the, uh, the deans, the heads of various department of law. And today we all are waiting to listen to sir about his observation regarding to the two constitutions, that is the US constitution and the Indian constitution, and whereby we will be honored to listen into the famous principle which has been held in Madbury versus Madison, that is the process of judicial review. So with this small note, I welcome you all from the Department of Law wholeheartedly, and nevertheless, we are awaiting over here for the commencement of the program. Thank you all. I now humbly request Honorable Mr. Justice Riyaz Chagla to kindly address the gathering on behalf of Mr. Iqbal Chagla, Senior Counsel, Bombay High Court. For Mr. Iqbal Chagla is unfortunately not present with us due to health reasons. Uh, Justice Rohinter Nariman, former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Dr. Rashmi Oza, the head of the Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Chair in Human Rights and Civil Liberties, other eminent dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, the former honorable judges of the Supreme Court, judges of the High Court, professors and ladies and gentlemen. Well, my father would have very much wanted to be here to, in, in especially for the occasion of the lecture, memorial lecture, in the name of my grandfather, in the memory of my grandfather, uh, the late Chief Justice M.C. Chagla. But due to ill health, he has not been able to be here. Well, he would have wanted to share a few words with you and uh, so I'm here stepping into his shoes and addressing you on his behalf. Well, uh, Rowington and my, fam my family, is his father, F Fali uh, Nariman, we've had a very close association o over the years. And I can't think of a better person and a more fitting tribute to my grandfather, the late Chief Justice M.C. Chagla, than to have him deliver the lecture, the seventh lecture of the Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Series. Well, there's a lot one can say about Rowington Nariman. He has achieved so much being a judge of the Supreme Court for over seven years. And well, his initial few years was in Mumbai and 
a few years at practice here before he moved to Delhi. Well, as a judge, he has delivered several landmark judgments, been part of the constitutional bench, an expert in constitutional law, having studied in depth the Indian Constitution and the US Constitution, both of which he will be sharing with us during his lecture. Well, he was part of the constitutional bench in the Sabrimala case. In fact, his dissent in the Sabrimala review case is worth reading. Then there are other, other cases such as the privacy case, the case which one refers to as the abolition of uh, the uh, unlawful sex, homose homosexuality case, one can say, the triple talaq case, and several other landmark judgments. As a judge, he was passionate about protecting free speech and controlling state regulation of free speech. He has also struck down Section 66A of the Information Technology Act. He's also been a voracious reader and has a, an enormous library of books in his different houses all over the country. Of an avid listener to music, and there are so many different hobbies which he has, which one cannot really, uh, one can only state a few. Well, his knowledge of as I, uh, uh, of Indian and world history is phenomenal, and he loves traveling the mountains and the hill stations, and he shared many holidays with his very close friend, uh, Mr. Fredun Divitri, senior counsel of the Bombay High Court, who also happens to be here. Well, the, because of such interest, he has in fact, um, well, uh, he, he has imbibed so much in life, and he is going to share some of this with us, which we are in indeed fortunate for him to be here. Well, I, I don't want to keep you for too long. I just wanted to say a few words. These are words which my father would have also shared with you uh, in, in, uh, uh, about uh, Justice Rowenton Nariman. Well, I would like to end here by just saying that it is indeed a privilege to have him here and to address you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, may I please call upon Dr. Rashmi M. Oza, Chair Professor, Justice Chagla Chair, to address the audience. Please, ma'am. Yeah. Revered Justice Rowenton Nariman, sir. Revered Justice Riyaz Chagla, sir. Uh, Shri Iqbal Chagla, though in absentia because he's not well and therefore he's been unable to attend today. Uh, Dr. Kamtekar, sir, the Finance and Accounts Officer of the University of Mumbai, my colleagues from the Department of Law and my colleagues from the Chembur Karnataka College of Law, esteemed trustees of Chief Justice M.C. Chakla Trust, esteemed members of the Maharashtra State Human Rights Commission, Honorable Justice B.N. Shri Krishna, sir, Honorable Justice Sujata Manor, ma'am, Honorable Justice Varyava, sir, all the esteemed dignitaries present here and whose name I may not be able to just uh, speak it out, the hall is full, honorable judges, councils, uh, the honorable members of the State Human Rights Commission, principals, faculties, and dear students, a very good evening to one and all, and wishing each one of you a very happy and blessed New Year 2023. It was why the Memorandum of Understanding executed by and between the University of Mumbai and the Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Trust that a chair was established in the memory of Chief Justice M.C. Chagla 
in the Department of Law in Human Rights and Civil Liberties. It's my proud privilege to be the Chair Professor of Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Chair uh, since the year 2015. The best tribute that one could give to Justice M.C. Chagla is remembering him by his autobiography, Roses in December, with a prologue that God gave us memory that we might have roses in December. The first edition of this book was out on the 30th of September, 1973. That coincidentally is the birth date of Justice M.C. Chagla, 30th of September. So far, we have conducted six Chief Justice Chagla Memorial lectures addressed by the eminent judges of the Honorable Supreme Court and the Bombay High Court. And today, we are truly privileged to have amidst us presence of Justice Rointon Nariman, sir, for addressing the seventh Chief Justice Chagla Memorial Lecture on the tale of two constitutions, India and the United States of America, the long and the short of it all. In the context of human rights, the Supreme Court of the United States of America has delivered various landmark judgments in Marbury versus Madison, Dred Scott versus Sanford, Brown versus Board of Education, and Plessy versus Ferguson. Recently, uh, the International Day on Elimination of uh, Violence Against Women was marked on the 25th of November 2022 and the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres made a very significant statement stating that violence against women and girl child is the most pervasive form of violence across the world. Every 11 minutes, a woman and a girl child is killed by the intimate life partners or the family members. So far as India is concerned, the Universal Periodic Review Report was uh, under scrutiny by the Human Rights Council at Geneva. It was just as late as November 2022. And along with India, the reports, periodic reports of 14 other nation states were being examined. When India's report was placed before the UN committee, Costa Rica asked India to end female genital mutilation. About 29 countries called India to ratify the Convention Against Torture and other cruel or inhuman degrading treatment or punishment which India hasn't done it, though it has signed the convention way back in 1997. In the year 2010 and 2070, there was a move by the Union government which laid the Prevention of Torture Bill before the Parliament, but unfortunately it failed to meet the standards of the United Nations. About 17 countries urged India to consider the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1976 that aimed at aboli abolition of death sentence. So no wonder we still have death sentence for few of the offenses within the Indian Penal Code. France had called India to accede to the second optional protocol to CEDAW, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, so that one could, uh, by providing an individual complaint mechanism. And the request was also to end all forms of discrimination, caste-based discrimination, and uh, prevent violence against them. All this, I think, is surely indicative of fact that all is not well with India. This is specifically so because when we are marching towards achievement of the 17 parameters of the Sustainable Development Goals by the year 2030, I think it's high time now that uh, India takes a stand and India you know, carries out some measures to realize that human rights are realized for all without any form of discrimination. So we are anxiously eager, you know, waiting for Justice Rointon Nariman, sir, to highlight us and compare the constitution of the U.S. and India. And the long and the short of it, sir, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Well, now is the time for which we all are waiting. So before I call upon our chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Nariman Rohington, to address the gathering, I would like to take the privilege of, on, of introducing his lordship, 
to you all. Mr. Justice Rohington Nariman was born on 13th August 1956. He finished his schooling from Mumbai and his commerce and law graduation from Delhi. He completed his LLM from Harvard Law School. His lordship enrolled as a lawyer in 1979. He was designated as senior counsel, Supreme Court of India, in 1993 at the young age of 37. The Supreme Court rules were amended by the then Chief Justice of India, M. N. Venkata Chalaya, and the full bench of the Supreme Court to designate him as senior counsel against the minimum age of 45 years. He has over 500 reported Supreme Court judgments to his credit as an advocate. His lordship served as the Solicitor General of India from 2011 to 13. In 2014, his lordship was elevated as a judge of the Supreme Court of India. He served for a tenure of seven years from 2014 to 21, during which he authored around 360 judgments on diverse subjects, in particular, constitutional law, arbitration, commercial and criminal matters. His lordship was recognized as one of the five world heroes by Access Now, an international human rights organization, for his concurring judgment in K.S. Puttuswamy versus Union of India, which recognized the right to privacy as a fundamental right under Article 20, 21 of the Constitution of India. He was selected by the Harvard Alumni Association for an interview with four other distinguished alumni in December 2020 that included Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, and Hisashi Owada, former president of the International Court of Justice, The Hague. His lordship is a great orator blessed with photogenic memory, which allows him to recall dates, names, events, and minute details and descriptions about the diverse subjects he speaks on. He has delivered numerous lectures on a large area of topics pertaining to law, literature, history, comparative religion, and music on various platforms. Currently, he has a YouTube channel called the Justice Nariman Official Channel, which has a collection of all his speeches. His Lordship has authored three books, namely, The Inner Fire, Zoroastrianism in Other Faiths, and Discordant Notes. His Lordship also has other interests, like he has a great passion for Western classical music and has deep knowledge in it. He has special interest in history, philosophy, literature, and science, and is an avid reader. He also has great interest in religious studies and is ordained as a Parsi priest. So we are indeed proud to have such a multifaceted expert amongst us. Sir, may we please have the pleasure of hearing your speech. Justice Sujata Manohar, Justice Sri Krishna, Justice Variava, Justice Riyaz Chagla, dignitaries on and off the dais, Fellow students, ladies and gentlemen, 1789 was an extremely important year in the history of the world. It gave birth to the French Revolution. It also gave birth to the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States was as the result of a huge armed struggle between the British and the American colonies, 13 of them. And it took six years of bloody warfare between 1775 and 1781 for the Americans to finally shrug off the British yoke. This was cemented by the famous Treaty of Paris in 1783. And then it took a few years for the Constitution to actually be born. It was born out of first a draft, which was called the Articles of Confederation. And ultimately, when it was debated in Philadelphia in 1787, a Virginia draft by James Madison really replaced it. And ultimately, the baby was born within exactly nine months because you had to have a ratification by at least nine out of the 13 states. Now, this took place exactly within nine months, so that it got ratified by 1788. And finally, when Congress adopted the Constitution on 7 January 1789, it came into being. The Constitution is a remarkable document. It's remarkably small. It has only six articles and several other sub-articles. In fact, the seventh article is only the fact that 
the constitution has to be ratified to come into force. There was no Bill of Rights in the original constitution. So one can see that it was a broad charter which was to govern 13 new states which had banded together to form a United States of America. Our constitution also came after one of the bloodiest struggles in the world, World War II, which happened between 53 nations. Our soldiers fought for the British Empire and lost their lives in that struggle. Fortuitously, after that struggle, the English government changed and finally heeded the calls for independence. Ultimately, post-independence, our constitution was forged from a huge shopping list of constitutions from all over the world. As a matter of fact, it took almost three years and articles were debated and re-debated. And finally, the most prolix constitution in the world came into being. You therefore had 395 articles. Remember, the US constitution had only seven. And the seven were very clear. You had in Article 1, the legislature, that is Congress, the two houses. In Article 2, you had the executive, the president of the United States and the vice president. In Article 3, you dealt with the judiciary. In Article 4, you dealt with the states, the 13 of them. In Article 5, you dealt with how the constitution is to be amended. In Article 6, you stated that the constitution was the supreme law of the land. And as I told you, Article 7 was ratification. As against that, our 395 articles were spread over 22 parts, as many as 22 parts. The first part dealt with citizenship. Then after citizenship, in fact, the first part really dealt with the union of India and the states. That is, India shall be a union of at least two states. Then you come to citizenship. Who shall be citizens, who shall not? Then you come to the single most important chapter in my reckoning, the fundamental rights chapter, chapter three. Chapter four deals with directive principles of state policy, largely borrowed from a Catholic Irish constitution. What the legislature is supposed to have in mind in order to put through a socialistic form of government. Then part five deals with the union, all three branches of them. Part 6 deals with the states, again all three branches of them. 7 is now redundant. 8 deals with union territories. 9 is important because 9 deals with panchayats. A large part of India is rural India. So you have part 9 dealing with rural India and local self-government general municipalities. Then you have part 10 which deals basically with tribal areas. Part 11 which deals with legislative and administrative relations between the union and the various states in our country. Part 12 deals with property contracts, etc. Part 13 is called the Our Commerce Clause, which deals with trade, commerce and intercourse between the union and the states. Part 14 is services under the states. Part 15 again is a very important innovation in this country because it sets up an election commission to oversee the election process all over the country. Part 16 then deals with certain other miscellaneous things. 17 deals with what we call the official language. 18 deals with emergency provisions. That is what is to happen if there is some armed insurrection or some invasion. And what are the powers that the executive gets pursuant to such an emergency uh, pro proclamation. 19 deals with certain miscellaneous matters such as articles which define articles that are used in the constitution. 20 is very important and significant. It contains only one article, but that article has been debated over n number of times, 368, which deals with amendment of our constitution. Then you have 21, which are temporary transitional provisions, and 22, the coming into force of our constitution itself. So as against these seven articles, you have these 22 parts and 395 articles. Hammered over, as I told you, about three years. The preambles of both constitutions also 
markedly differ. The preamble of the United States Constitution, which tells us what the actual objective of framing that Constitution was, is stated that, actually states that we, the people of the United States, now, we, the people of the United States in 1789, did not include women, white or black, did not include the native population, the Red Indian, and certainly did not include all the blacks who were at that time largely slaves. So you had we the people consisting of something like much less than 50% of the population. Anyway, these people then, in order to form a more perfect union, this is very important, bear it in mind, to form a more perfect union and basically to establish justice, not as understood in our constitution, but justice as meted out by a court of law. Then to provide for the common defense, which was a very important thing, because each state has its own militia. To provide for the general welfare of the people. And most important, to secure to the people the blessings of liberty, not only for themselves, but for their posterity. Because don't forget, it is they and their forefathers who actually threw off the British yoke. So it is important to remember that the foremost objectives of the US Constitution were really two. One, to proclaim that we are now independent of the British yoke. We are no longer governed by the British. And the second to say that 13 nation states have given up part of their sovereignty to ultimately form a United States of, India, of America. The Indian Constitution's preamble is very different. It also begins with we the people. Here, of course, we the people was also some very small percentage of the people because the Constituent Assembly didn't represent the people as a whole. But then we went on to say that we the people were basically going to form a sovereign democratic republic. Sovereign, why? Because we, like the Americans, threw off the British yoke. Democratic, because it is the ballot that is now going to give us governments in future. Republic as opposed to monarchy. We are going to have a president as the head of state, an elected president, mind you. Then we come to the important concept of justice. You see, justice was alone, stand, a standalone word in the preamble of the US Constitution. Here, justice is social, economic, political. Political justice was, as a matter of fact, almost as the Constitution came into force because everybody above 21 was granted the right to vote. So it was almost like you got political justice immediately. Social and economic justice had to wait. Then you had the famous trio or the war cry of the French Revolution. You didn't just have liberty, which the US Constitution had. You had also equality and fraternity. Now, these concepts are very, very important to understand. You have liberty, fine, of thought, expression, faith, belief, worship. What about equality of status and opportunity? Now, both these nations started with a great stain on them. The stain on the United States was the stain of slavery. The stain upon us was the stain of thousands of years of untouchability. Now, how did we get over this? You will find conspicuous by its absence any reference to either equality or fraternity in the preamble of the US Constitution. There was no equality. They accepted that as a fact. And it took a bloody civil war between 1861 and 1865 and the assassination of a brave president for the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments to come through by which slavery got abolished and equality or the equal protection of the law for the first time came into being. So, whereas our constitution gave us equality of status and opportunity immediately, it took the United States some 70 or 80 years to get this. Also, you will find fraternity is one thing that is missing completely from the US Constitution. 
Fraternity is a very, very important concept. Why? Because it, it is only when you are fraternal towards your friends, fellow citizen that the unity of the nation in its huge diversity gets assured. Because otherwise it's very, very difficult to have a unified nation if you are not fraternal or if you are fraternal in the biblical sense of Cain and Abel. One, one, one brother wants to kill the other. Now, having given you this broad outline of these two great constitutions, we start first with the stain of slavery. The United States, as I told you, actually at the time of its prom the promulgation of its constitution in 1789, had what were called free states and slave states. The North, by and large, was free. The South, which had huge plantations to run, were slave states. So, slavery was something which you found in the Constitution itself. As I told you, it took the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments to do away with these provisions. But then what were these provisions in 1789? In Article 1, Section 2, you had a provision which was a very peculiar one, which was called the Three-Fifth Clause. It was a compromise that James Madison ironed out. Representation in Parliament, that is their Congress, and taxation was based upon the proportionate number of persons in states. Now, how do you count those persons? So the Constitution said they'll be counted as free men, Red Indians who pay taxes, not those who don't pay taxes, and three-fifths of others. Now, three-fifths of others meant that you did not recognize the black as a human being. Three-fifths perhaps was a compromise maybe between northern states, southern states, but whatever it was, blacks were regarded as three-fifths of being human. Second, Article 1, Section 9, an amend, a, a, a provision which could not be amended till 1808. This is very important to remember. The amendment power couldn't touch it. Persons were entitled, white persons were entitled to import slaves on a payment of not more than $10 per person. You cannot have something more explicit than this provision. And even more explicit, in Article 4, Section 2, we are told that if a slave runs away from his master and runs into a free state, the master can bring him back into the slave state and treat him as property. Now, as I told you, it took about 70 to 80 years for them to get rid of these provisions and have the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. What did we do here? By a stroke of the pen, we abolished untouchability, straight away, our Article 17 in our fundamental rights. We also made it clear that anything to do with untouchability, whether spoken, written, or acted on, is to be made an offense, and Parliament passed an act almost immediately, making untouchability or stating that somebody is untouchable to be an offense. Apart from that, to give them a leg, act, uh, leg up, we resorted to the reservation principle, which is that you have reservations in public employment, reservations in the legislatures, etc., to try and give these socially and educationally disadvantaged persons a leg up so that ultimately they may join us in society. So, given these two stains, we now come to the broad division of powers in the two constitutions. In the US Constitution, you had a complete division between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. This was because the founding fathers there took to heart a book called The Spirit of Law by a French gentleman called Montesquieu. And we have, therefore, in Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the U.S. Constitution, completely separate provisions dealing with the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. In our Constitution, on the other hand, we have adopted what was called the Westminster model with some modifications, because you can't have a titular king, but instead you have an elected president now as head of state. Our president, mind you, is head of state, 
their president is the head of the executive our president also forms part of the legislative wing of government article 79 specifically says our houses of parliament and the president happen to be the legislature for this country so what was very important was that whereas we had this westminster model which was beautifully described in justice krishnayar's picturesque language in shamsher singh versus state of punjab a 1975 judgment he put it this way he said it's not from the potomac but from the thames that we fertilize the yamuna <laughs> so <laughs> it is therefore not washington but london which really fertilizes delhi because the yamuna yamuna passes through delhi so whereas we have a cabinet system with the prime minister at the head which is responsible to our houses of parliament the president there is not responsible to congress at all he is responsible directly to the people so the people can vote him out after four years if they don't like him whereas here our ministers have have to be members of parliament and they are given a certain time 6 months within which to become if they are first ministers otherwise they are out so we have what walter bajo called this buckle the cabinet which fastens itself on to the legislative wing so to speak from the executive now given these broad distinctions given the westminster model what is the distinction then between the houses of parliament the united states also has an upper house the senate and the lower house the house of representatives one huge difference is that the senate is to consist of two senators from each state it makes no difference as to what the population of the state is so if you are dc or if you are california it makes no difference both states will get only two senators and the senate consists of a house of 100 the house of representatives is directly elected by the people like our lok sabha our rajya sabha on the other hand is a council of states in which you have proportional representation depending upon the population of each state now apart from these basic differences the legislative wing which is completely independent of the executive in the us has one very important check and balance which we don't have and it's called the presidential veto in article 1 section 7 you have let us say both houses both houses of congress passing a certain bill the president objects to the bill and sends it back both houses of parliament then have to repass that same bill but this time with a two third majority so that's a very very real check on legislative power which we don't have fortunately or unfortunately otherwise also in terms of distribution of legislative relations we must never forget that they were originally 13 nation states who gave up some part of their sovereignty to band together as the united states of america so it is the states who have the residual power of legislation unlike us the center as here and congress in article 1 section 8 is only given certain enumerated powers beyond which they cannot legislate the most important power is the power to declare war to have standing armies to levy and collect taxes and to regulate commerce among the states and the center apart from this there aren't too many powers whereas if you look at our long list in the seventh schedule you have a union list consisting of 97 entries where the union is given an overwhelming share of legislative power if i may put it that way you have 66 entries in the state list and you have 47 entries in a concurrent list now concurrent means both parliament and the states can share power so far as that entry is concerned something unknown to the united states the united states exercised concurrent power only once when the 18th amendment was passed which was the prohibition amendment the amendment said it will be enforced by both the center and the states 
so concurrent power of legislation was given and executive action was given to enforce prohibition otherwise the united states has no concurrent power so whereas you have a real federation in the united states here you have something which we call quasi federal really tipped heavily towards the center because don't forget unlike them we were an amalgam of princely states in and british india we did not really have states in that sense which were nation states which retained their identity which continued with their own constitutions because don't forget every state in the united states has its own constitution so we have only one constitution jammu and kashmir apart also which has now gone but jammu and kashmir apart we are one nation in that sense we are not a conglomerate of 13 nation states now under article 1 section 9 you have certain limitations now on congress for example during an emergency which is either a rebellion or an invasion the writ of habeas corpus which is a very very important writ by which courts exercise the right of a person or in fact help to exercise the right of a person to obtain personal liberty that writ can be suspended during an emergency in the united states in fact that was suspended by none other than abraham lincoln during the civil war here given our legislative history given the fact that we had an emergency the aftermath of the emergency in article 359 now is that our article 21 along with 20 which are certain safeguards can never be suspended so in that department at least we are one up the other interesting thing is that in the united states another check is on legislative activities the legislature cannot pass a bill of attainder nor can it make what is called an ex post facto or retrospective law now bill of attainder even we can't pass because a bill of attainder in essence is a legislative judgment where the legislature sits in individual judgment on a particular person that's out in our constitution as well but ex post facto laws which are out in the united states are permissible here subject of course to the fundamental rights chapter so that's one other important distinction and one other interesting thing in article 1 section 10 you have what is called the contract clause which is a stranger to our constitution there the states are told that you shall make no law impairing the obligations of contracts now very early in their history in fletcher versus peck an 1810 judgment of chief justice marshall the georgia legislature had acted fraudulently and had given away by law huge lands to some four individuals another group of legislators came in or were elected to the georgia legislature subsequently who repealed that law the repeal was struck down by chief justice marshall saying that you have impaired the obligation of a contract because you the legislature specifically said i now contract with you to give you this land and we are not going into bala fides etc having done that you have violated the contract clause another interesting judgment was in 1819 which is called the dartmouth college case where again dartmouth college was established by a charter of george the 3rd and dartmouth college tried to change its charter from being public so from being private to being public that again was struck down under the contract clause so the contract clause was actually used in the early years in quite extreme situations but that doesn't obtain so far as we are concerned we now come to the interesting article 2 or the executive now as i told you in, in the beginning the head of the executive there is the president our president is an elected head of state very different from theirs both are commanders in chief of the armed forces but their president exercises executive powers along with that famous veto and he chooses his own cabinet to do so he is given four years and he can stand for president only twice 
unlike our president or prime minister who can stand n number of times. There's no limit. And that twice came into being only in 1951 by an amendment because President Roosevelt had actually broken the constitutional convention set by George Washington himself that you must step down after the second term. Jefferson followed it, uh, Madison followed it, Monroe followed it, but Roosevelt didn't. And Roosevelt stood and was elected four times in a row. And obviously Congress thought that the same person coming back four times in a row would sound a death knell to democracy as they knew it. So this was limited only to two. The election of the president there takes place in a very peculiar way. You have an electoral college first. The electoral college consists of the number of representatives of each state in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. So let's say California has 55 such persons. It will be 55 plus two because there are two senators for every state. So it has 57 of these electors who are sent. And each elector is sent under state law. So each state can have its own method of selecting its electors to go to that electoral college. Once at the electoral college, then each elector from the state votes. Now assume that California has sent, let us say, 11 electors. And six have voted for a Republican president, five have voted for a Democrat president. Six may be only 51 to 49 of the popular vote, but there the winner takes all. So that even though it's only six who have voted, all 55 of the votes counted will go to that winner. And therefore, ultimately, he must get the magic figure of 270 out of 538, which is almost half. We have 535, which is 100 plus 435 representatives, and three for the state of DC. We are very, very different. We, on the other hand, don't involve the people at all. We elect our president through an electoral college, again, consisting of parliament on the one end and the Vidhan Sabhas on the other. So you have parliament, which is both houses. Let's say they tote up to 50. The Vidhan Sabhas, even though they may tote up to 500, are ultimately given only half the vote. So that in the electoral college that selects our president, half the voice is that of the central legislature, half the voice is that of the states. And the majority votes go to the person, uh, whichever goes to the person, that person then stands elected. Impeachment also is a very different process. As you know, our president stands for five years as opposed to their four years. If the US president is to be impeached, he can only be impeached in the Senate, which is the upper house. Lower house has nothing to do with impeachments there. And he can be impeached basically for high, what they call high crimes and misdemeanors. Our president can be impeached on much broader grounds. If he's done anything contrary to the Constitution, under Article 56, you can move a motion to impeach him. But that motion has to be passed by one house, whichever. Let's assume it is passed by the Lok Sabha. It has to be two-thirds of the entirety of the house, not two-thirds present and voting like them. And once that motion is passed by two-thirds, and accepted by two-thirds of the other house, again entirety. Only then does our president get impeached. So it's a very difficult procedure to get rid of our president. Now, apart from these two differences in appointment as well as uh, getting rid of, our president, as I told you, is really a figurehead. Our president is not a person who, enjoy, who enjoys independent powers except in two or three exceptional situations, such as, for example, when a house is to be dissolved, who is to form the next government, etc. Otherwise, he is to act only on the aid and advice of the cabinet of ministers. Another important thing, unlike the presidential veto there, our president can return a bill to a particular house once. If that House considers that it should pass the bill nonetheless, it passes it by the same majority. 
So there's no veto here. We now come to the third and most important branch, according to me, of both constitutions, the judiciary. Now, Article 3 sets up their judiciary and says that it will have original jurisdiction only in disputes between states, essentially, and appellate jurisdiction so far as the constitution and the laws of the United States are concerned. In short, it doesn't touch the states or their laws. The states have their own constitutions, their own judiciary, their own Supreme Court. So you have two parallel systems which work over there. And here you have a three-tier system, that is the federal system. You have a district court structure, you have a court of appeal structure, and then the U.S. Supreme Court. And by and large, what goes up is really matters of constitutional importance. Also matters, some matters of legal importance, but by and large constitutional importance. As opposed to this structure, we have a unitary structure. We have high courts for each of the states. And we have appeals from those high courts. Not only do we have appeals from those high courts, we have Article 136, which I don't think has any parallel in the world, which has been exercised by all of us, that is by Justice Manohar, Justice Variava, Justice Sri Krishna and myself, like the Chancellor's foot. Anything that comes up from anywhere, you can entertain, almost. So you have a very, very vast appellate jurisdiction, which really makes our Supreme Court like a national court of appeal. It was actually meant to be a constitutional court, but then that went reasonably fast. And really speaking, we are involving ourselves in matters which we shouldn't be involving ourselves at all. So you have these great differences between the two judiciaries. We now come to a very vexed question, the question of judicial appointments. Judicial appointment in the United States does not involve the judiciary at all. You have the president who appoints, and you have the Senate who confirms. This country chose a completely different path, fortunately for us. What this country did was, it said in Article 124 for appointment of the Supreme Court, that the president may, after consulting such judges as he thinks fit, that is of the higher courts, High Court and Supreme Court, appoint a judge of the Supreme Court, provided that he must also always consult the Chief Justice of India. Now, that provision worked till 1990, that is after the first judges case of seven judges, in the following manner. Basically, it meant that the executive put forward a name of a judge for the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice was consulted, and once he's consulted, whether he says yes or no, ultimately the name can go forward. In practice, of course, in the first 20 or 30 years, by and large, what the Chief Justice said was followed, but that's a different matter. In 1991, nine judges were constituted in order to go into this appointment process. And what they did was, they applied Chief Justice Marshall's famous dictum. Never forget, it is a constitution that we are expounding. Now, what did Marshall mean by that? He meant that you cannot look at constitutions like you look at statutes. Every word that a constitution has must be imbued with some constitutional principle. The constitutional principle here is the independence of the judiciary. And that is crucial to a democracy. And what is independence of the judiciary? If not, independent and fearless judges being appointed. Unless you have that happening, forget it. It's useless. So, what was done by nine judges was to say that consultation now means concurrence. Something you can say very easily when you keep that broad principle in mind, independence of judiciary. Who would know better than the Chief Justice of India whether a judge should be appointed or shouldn't? And second, taking the first part by itself, the president may consult such of the judges as he deems necessary is really an arbitrary power. 
he may consult he may not consult he may only consult those who give a yes give yes as an answer so what the court therefore laid down was that you are not only to consult the chief justice who you will have to obey but you will also consult senior judges in essence and senior judges would therefore put paid to any argument that this first part of 124 would lead to arbitrariness so ultimately the judiciary took into its own hands the appointment process we have heard a diatribe by the law minister of the day against this process let me assure the law minister that there are two very basic constitutional fundamentals that he must know one fundamental is that unlike the united states five a minimum of five unelected judges are trusted with the interpretation of the constitution article 1453 there is no equivalent in the united states so five minimum five what we call a constitution bench are trusted to interpret the constitution finally and once those five or more have interpreted that basic document it is your bounden duty as an authority under article 144 to follow that judgment now you may criticize it as a citizen i may criticize it no problem but never forget unlike me who am a citizen today you are an authority and as an authority you are bound by that judgment right or wrong so we must remember that our appointment process was really in answer to the felt need of the times at that point of time keeping this broad rubric of independence of judiciary in the forefront what has been done is nothing unknown to constitutional law unlike what many people seem to be saying it is known to constitutional law it is in fact something by which it is your duty as a supreme court to ultimately put forward in the best way possible a constitutional ideal given the times now having said this we go to the other very very important facet of both constitutions the amendment procedure in the united states it's a very cumbersome difficult procedure you have to go through two thirds of each house of parliament or their congress and you have to have a ratification by three quarters of the states today there are 51 states now in the 235 years since the constitution was promulgated you've had only 27 amendments there you've had as many as 10000 that were proposed mark the figure in our country in the 74th year of our republic we have crossed the century mark why is that because in our country you have three kinds of amendments known to our constitution in the us there are only two one is two thirds of both houses and three fourths or you hold up what is called a constitutional convention to do the same thing in our country you can actually change a state territory wise without amending the constitution you have article 3 something unheard of in most other countries certainly unheard of in the united states so if tomorrow theoretically the center wants to say we abolish every single state in this country we have only because india has to be bharat has to be two states we'll have province a and we have this median line up here and province b here nothing anybody can do all that they have to do is to actually send this proposal to the vidhan sabha of every state legislature let's assume every state legislature says we don't agree they can bulldoze this that is a very very big difference between our constitution and theirs so the first type of amendment is an amendment which takes place by ordinary legislation and the constitution stands amended 
and it's not deemed to be a constitutional amendment for the purpose of the procedure in Article 368. The second type of constitutional amendment is where two-thirds of each house present and voting, not the entire strength of the house, like impeachment of our president, with a minimum of at least half. So theoretically, you can have half the house sit and two-thirds of that half pass an amendment. And the third type is where certain subject matters, five of them, need to be ratified by half the states. So we have these three provisions to amend our constitution. And as I told you, over a hundred uh, such amendments have been passed in these 74 years of our republic. Given this background, we now come to another very important constitutional functionary, the Vice President of India, who said something against what was laid down in our seminal judgment of 13 judges, Keshavananda Bharti, by a 7 to 6 majority. Thank God they did it. They said there is such a thing as basic structure of our constitution. And you, that you cannot, even in your constituent capacity, you parliament cannot, even in your constituent capacity, tamper with. At first, it was taken with a pinch of salt, but then the salt had its savor because almost immediately within two years, you had Indira Gandhi's own case. And you had four out of five minority judges in Keshavananda applying the law now in order to strike down the 39th Amendment. An attempt was made by a pliable Chief Justice, Chief Justice Ray, during the emergency. He constituted a bench of 13. The great Nani Palkhewala went there and convinced eight of the judges that this bench was wrongly constituted because the bench was constituted only to undo Keshavananda Bharti or the basic structure principle. So attempt one failed. Attempt two then became the 42nd amendment, which added two articles, sub-articles to Article 368. The purport of those sub-articles was that you, the courts, cannot touch a constitutional amendment on any ground. This was challenged in the first Minerva Mills case, and fortunately for us, struck down by both majority and minority judges. Chief Justice Chandrachud speaking for the majority and Justice Bhagwati, otherwise speaking for the minority on Article 31C. So attempt two also failed. From 1980 till date, this extremely important weapon in the hands of the judiciary has been used n number of times as one of the extremely important checks and balances in our constitution to check an executive when it acts beyond the constitution. And the last time it was used was probably to strike down the 99th amendment, which was the National Judicial Appointments Commission. So let us remember when we speak of the basic structure doctrine that it is a doctrine that has been used by minority judges first. It is a doctrine that was sought to be undone twice. And that was sought to be done over 40 years ago. Since then, nobody has said a word about it, except very recently. So let us be clear that this is something that has come to stay. And speaking for myself, thank God it has come to stay. Now moving on from amendment, we come to the great Bill of Rights of the United, Constitution, uh, United States Constitution. As I told you, the United States Constitution did not start off with the Bill of Rights. There was a big fight between Madison on the one hand and Hamilton on the other. The one saying, we don't need anything because it's already there, and the other saying, no, we need something explicit. Anyway, ultimately Madison had his way. And you had as a result, the first 10 amendments. Now, the first amendment of the US Constitution has three things within it. One is, and mind you, these are in absolute terms, unlike our Constitution. Congress shall make no law 
which abridges uh, the freedom of speech, abridges assembly, and which makes dents into religious freedom. We have each of these in our constitution, but unlike the United States, we have a balancing act to be performed. Ultimately, even in the United States, except for Justices Black and Douglas, so far as free speech is concerned, a balancing act is performed. So, when we have an infraction, let us say, of free speech, first you have to see that that infraction is reasonable. That is, it is absolutely necessary to infract free speech. Second, it is tied to eight specific subject matters, otherwise freedom of speech must reign. And those eight matters are sovereignty, integrity of India, security of state, public order, friendly relations with foreign states, decency, morality, obscenity, for example, then contempt of court, incitement to an offense, etc. So unless it is tied to one of these and it is reasonable, that is reasonably necessary, in India, freedom of speech cannot be curtailed. So far as religion is concerned, we have a facilis of articles, but the most important is 25, which subjects religious rights to, sub to public order, morality, health, and of course to other persons' rights. That is subject to other persons' fundamental rights. So far as assembly is concerned, again we have the same reasonable restriction in the interest of public order, etc. Fortunately for us, we have no Second Amendment. Now, the Second Amendment there has led to a lot of problems because historically it is a known fact that each state had a militia. And when each state had a militia, it was important that you keep certain rights of the state's militias intact, which is why you gave them this right to keep and bear arms. That was the understanding of the U.S. Supreme Court until Justice Kalia came along and said, no, you can buy guns off the counter like a sweet. So that therefore in America, you have all these horrible wanton shootings that have been going on. God knows how many people get murdered each year in the name of this great amendment. But fortunately, we don't have it. You then have the famous fifth. Now, the fifth again is a facilis of rights. We have all of them. We, we have them contained in 20, 21, 31. So you have the right not to incriminate yourself in a criminal trial. You have a right against double jeopardy. You shouldn't be tried for the same offense twice. You have your right to personal liberty, which is most precious. And fortunately for us, after Meneka Gandhi's case, the list of the rights that are covered by personal liberty is ever growing the most recent being the right to privacy. And, of course, you did have the right to property, which now has been removed. So, in India, we have no right to property. There you have the right, a fundamental right to just compensation. In India, we had a history of agrarian reform. And largely due to agrarian reform acts being opposed on property right grounds, Ultimately, the legislature thought it fit to do away with the property right altogether, right or wrong. So, we have all these great rights. We have in their Sixth Amendment the right to a speedy criminal trial. In their Eighth Amendment to uh, no excessive bails and fines, no cruel and unusual punishment, all of which are subsumed in our fundamental rights as well. But you have a very interesting right in the Ninth Amendment, which you don't have here. The Ninth Amendment is an amendment which says that the fact that we have stated these first eight amendments as rights doesn't mean that we have taken away any other rights that you may have had. Now, that we don't have. And in Griswold versus Connecticut, which is a privacy case of 1965, in fact, Justice Goldwater founded the right of privacy only in the Ninth Amendment, saying that privacy was something that started with Entig versus Carrington, that an Englishman's home is his castle, and that therefore privacy is something which inheres in us, has always inhered in us, 
and it's a Ninth Amendment right. The majority judgment also used the Ninth Amendment but added third and fourth along with it. You come to our fundamental rights. We have certain rights which the United States don't have. And don't forget one other important thing. The United States had no directive principle chapter, no fundamental duties, which we have. We have the great right to equality. We have both the English equality before law and the US equal protection of the laws. We have in Article 15 something which it took them 200 years, namely the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s to enact to prevent discrimination when it came to inns, etc., by private persons. Otherwise, discrimination was only against the state. We've got that in Art Article 15.1 in any case. Of course, we've got reservation. And we have certain rights in Article 19 which were taken from the free city of Danzig, post-World War I, therefore much, much later. The right to move freely all over India, the right to reside anywhere in India, which are not there. One blot, if I may say so, with great respect to our founding fathers, is Article 22, which is preventive detention. That is to detain somebody without a formal trial. And these preventive detention acts have been misused, which is why the judiciary bends over backwards when it's a preventive detention case to uphold the slightest technical error in the detention order and strike it down. That is one, one difficult area of our constitution which doesn't obtain in most other constitutions. And of course, we have a remarkable right, which is the right to, reserve, uh, to preserve our culture. This is fantastic in Article 29. India is therefore a land where there is huge diversity. And it is this diversity through that cultural right which leads to unity. In the United States, it's the exact opposite. What happens is that you are either born in the United States, let's say, to immigrant parents who've come from India. From the time of your birth, you are cut off from your mother country and you become American, so to speak. So they believe that you have a melting pot of all the civilizations in the world all of which, through the, the, through the crucible of the United States, produces Americans. Here, on the other hand, you retain, everybody retains his identity and respects everybody else's, is the vision that we have had. And our founding fathers, fortunately, therefore, introduced this concept of fraternity. To end this talk, ultimately, it is important to remember that you may have forged for yourself an excellent constitution. But if ultimately those who are the institutions under it malfunction, there's very little you can do. Constitution should be written off. I would strongly hope that our Supreme Court has a fifth judge's case, namely, that they would constitute another bench of at least five judges in which this MOP which is bandied about, memorandum of procedure, finally whatever their loose ends are there, tie them up and finish it. And that constitution bench should, in my humble opinion, lay down once and for all that once a name is sent by the collegium to the government. If the government has nothing to say within a period of, let's say, 30 days, then it will be taken that it has nothing to say. This sitting on names is a very deadly thing against democracy in this country, because what you're really doing is, you're waiting out a particular collegium to hope that another collegium changes its mind. And that happens all the time. Because you, the government, are continuous. You carry on for five years, at least. The collegiums that come have a huge attrition rate. So this is one very important thing that a judgment of our court should lay down. Second, it should also lay down that once there is a reiteration after this, let us assume that within 30 days, 
government says no for good reason and reasons are said back to government saying no please appoint whether at the end of 30 days or the end of the reiteration appointment also should be to, should take place within a fixed time period whatever that time period <laughs> ultimately as i told you earlier it is how a constitution is worked and if you don't have independent and fearless judges say goodbye there's nothing left as a matter of fact according to me if finally this last bastion falls or were to fall we would enter the abyss of a new dark age in which lakshman's common man would ask himself only one question if the salt has lost its savor wherewith shall it be salted thank you all very much thank you very much sir for your enlightening speech it truly was a pleasure hearing you may i now please request dr rajeshri anwarari professor and former head department of law to present the word of thanks honorable mr justice rohinton nariman former judge supreme court of india honorable mr justice riya chagla judge of the bombay high court dr rashmi ozha chair professor of justice chagla dr swati rautela head of the department mr kamtekar finance officer of the university of mumbai and dignitaries present in this hall it is my privilege to present vote of thanks on behalf of the organizers we are grateful to honorable mr justice rohinton nariman former judge supreme court of india for accepting our invitation and delivering seventh chief justice mc chagla memorial lecture on the topic of a tale of two constitutions india and the united states the long and short of it all thank you sir for enlightening us about the significance of various aspects of the constitution of india and united states by elaborating landmark supreme court cases justice rohinton nariman's expertise in comparative constitutional law and civil law along with his photographic memory has been experienced by all of us in his just concluded scholarly lecture indeed justice nariman's talk was an intellectual treat for all of us here in fact his lordship is known for his scholarship which extend beyond the frontiers of law ranging from religion to history and literature we sincerely thank your lordship from the bottom of our hearts for accepting our invitation despite of you are extremely busy schedule i request all distinguished participants of the program to give standing ovation to honorable mr justice rohinton nariman sir We are also grateful to family members of Justice Rohinton Nariman for their gracious presence. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Mr. Justice Riyaz Chagla, Judge of the Bombay High Court, carries on his shoulders the rich legacy of his illustrious grandfather and his equally illustrious father. friends justice riya chagla is not only known for his excellent collection of facts and appreciation of law but also for his pleasant disposition and for giving a patient hearing to the lawyers which makes him a super hit specially with the junior lawyers <laughs> thank you 
your lordship our heartfelt thanks to you for your gracious presence on this memorable occasion and delivering informative speech our hearty thanks are due to mrs riyas chagla and family members of chagla our special thanks are due to justice sujata manohar for her gracious presence thank you madam we express our deep gratitude towards honorable justice b n sri krishna former judge of the supreme court of india and honorable justice variyawa for gracing this occasion <laughs> we are thankful to honorable professor d t shirke in charge vice chancellor of the university of mumbai professor ajay bhamre pro vice chancellor of the university of mumbai professor s g birud registrar of the university of mumbai for their continuous support and guidance in organizing educational and academic events we are thankful to mr pradeep kamtekar sir finance officer of the university of mumbai for his active support in providing necessary assistance in organizing the program my sincere thanks are due to our dear colleague dr rashmi oza chair professor of justice chagla chair for taking special efforts for organizing this program and showing us documentary film of justice mc chagla sir and enlightening us about the theme of today's lecture we appreciate your dedication in the legal field dr oza keep it up we are thankful to doc advocate kaushik oza brother of dr oza for his gracious presence we are grateful to dr swati rautela professor and my beloved head of the law department for taking initiative and extending all necessary cooperation in organizing this program and welcoming our guests our special thanks are due to honorable shriyut m a said member of the state human rights commission and mr bhagwantra more sir member of the state human rights commission for their gracious presence our thanks are also due to senior advocate anil harish sir for gracing this occasion we are thankful to advocate rui rodrigues council of the university of mumbai for his continuous support to the law department and giving us legal advice time to time we are grateful to media and press reporters for their presence and support in the recording of the program we are also thankful to all distinguished guests principals of the law colleges dr sanjay jadhav dr alka patil mrs dipali patil advocate rama rao my other colleagues from the law department most dear students of the law colleges of the mumbai and suburbs of the mumbai mr pramod shah professor priya and professor sandeep from karnataka law college and other volunteers of karnataka law college LLM and Phil PhD students of the law department university of mumbai student volunteers teaching and non teaching staff of the law department university of mumbai staff of the gad and engineering section of the university of mumbai for their active support and participation in this program and for making this event successful thank you very much everyone thank you very much ma'am now let's conclude this program with the national song may i kindly request everyone to please rise for the same
Thank you very much, everyone.